So has anyone here heard the South American proverb that broth will raise the dead? Well, I've researched broth for 20 years, and my biggest disappointment was I did not find one shred of evidence that it will do this. In fact, I discovered that broth can kill. Killed Julia Child in 2004, French onion soup. Killed President Millard Fillmore, beef broth, 1874. Robert E. Lee, 1870. Allen Ginsberg, chicken soup, 1997. And Marie Antoinette died after drinking French consomme. So you're a pretty smart group, so I think by now you figured out broth didn't kill these people, and of course correlation does not equal causation. So I'm the naughty nutritionist, and I couldn't resist starting out with a little mischief. But from now on, this talk is going to roll to a brisk boil because I got a whole lot of science to cover in very little time. And if I don't get it all in and you've still got questions, I'm going to be at the French, uh, excuse me, the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund booth for the rest of the afternoon. So you've all heard that chicken soup is Jewish penicillin. And a lot of people believe that, whether or not they're Jewish. And there's a long history of very good experts, medical experts, and others who believe that to be true, most famously Moses Maimonides in the 19th, 12th century. And uh, he took it from Galen and before him, Hippocrates. But the idea of Jewish penicillin, it's so ingrained in our culture that comedians really run with it. Uh, a Jewish woman had two chickens. One got sick, so the woman made chicken soup out of the other to help the sick one get well. <laughs> this would not play if people didn't understand the healing power of chicken soup. Florence Nightingale took the celebrity chef of her age to the Crimean War to help wounded soldiers get well quickly with nourishing high quality broth. In her notes on nursing, she talked about invalid cookery and meat tea and other health foods, broth, gravy aspect. We're talking about broth and gelatin. Old cookbooks always had a chapter on, on helping people get well. Mrs. Beaton's cookbook, uh, Fanny Farmer cookbook, all using words like, this will cure for sure, or in my experience, this will always be beneficial. Community soup kitchens, we all know that's to help the malnourished and misfortuned. And uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, best-selling title, uh, you know, because it means so much to so many people in terms of physical and mental health. But some of you might be asking, is it paleo? Because paleo people didn't have a pot to cook in. But someone really early on probably noticed that when they were cooking meat on a stick over the fire that some of those good juices were disappearing and lost. So they started getting some bright ideas and this continued on until people regularly could afford and have pots. But early on they were doing things like animal skins, cooking water and meat and adding hot stones first and sometimes putting it over the fire as you see in this Irish woodcut from 1581. And then of course some things we'd make soup from came conveniently in their own pot like turtles. So people would cook the turtle in its own pot and then keep the pot. Then uh, first uh, ceramic pots coming out of Asia 20,000 or more years ago. Uh, this is a Japanese pot uh, 17th century Dutch pot, and some very expensive metal pots. Originally, these were extremely expensive and heavy items. We are very blessed to have so, so many fine uh, examples of, of stock pots to choose from today. Now, one of the great myths about soup is that people for thousands of years, all people would keep a stock pot on their stove or on the hearth simmering with good broth. The reality is in the industrial age, the poor would have loved to have made soup, but even if they had a pot, they couldn't afford the fuel. This was a huge problem leading to widespread malnutrition, part of the problem. An inventor named Papin came up with a solution. He called it a digester of bones, fast broth, like a pressure cooker. 
but it was so expensive it would take a, you know, a year's salary from somebody who is poor. So as it turned out, it did not take off and Papin himself died poor. Now, wherever we go around the world and we see healthy people, as Dr. Weston Price did with his research, uh, some form of soups and stews and gravies or aspics or whatever is part of the culture. And more recently, we have celebrity chefs, people like Fergus Henderson in London, and his famous book, The Whole Beast, uh, popularizing the whole idea of nose to tail eating. And this is very much part of being healthy through broth because the nose to tail includes not just the muscle meats and chops, but it includes the organ meats and the carcass and the skin. Julia Child popularized the idea of gourmet cooking, fine cooking with stock being an essential part of that. And recently, Jennifer McLoggin's terrific books on bones, fat, and odd bits. And the incomparable Tony Bourdain, to me, life without veal stock is life not worth living. So how does soup play a part in the standard American diet? How is soup contributing to the health of the gentleman to the right there? Well, sadly, the typical soup in the modern American diet is going to be canned or dried or worse. And uh, we think of Campbell's soup as being one of the worst products out there, and today we certainly cannot recommend it, high in MSG and other additives and a lot of problems there. But when Campbell's soup was invented, it was actually a good product. In 1870, uh, Joseph Campbell came up with a soup, and the recipe involved a fat fowl. You know, they always talked about the fat ones. That's what they wanted, a fat fowl and pounds and pounds of butter. Real butter, we're talking, real ingredients. But Campbell's soup, as we think of it, started at the turn of the last century with a guy named John Dorrance. And he was brilliant, and he was sophisticated. He was an MIT chemist, a gourmet chef, traveled in Europe, and his desire was to condense soup so it could be sold to the masses and nourish the masses and bring high quality food. And his original offerings, Campbell's Soup offerings, were, were rather gourmet items and that's how they advertised it as well. So that was an early Campbell's Soup label. You know, they got on to the red and white idea early. But unfortunately, this is what we have today, and the ingredient lists, uh, MSG, and a lot of additives, a lot of problems. And yet, whenever people are talking about the dangers of Campbell's or Progresso or other modern soups, guess what they talk about? The salt. The salt's probably the least of the problems in there. <laughs> so some of you might be thinking, I don't want to make bone broth, or what the vegans call corpse juice. <laughs> so some people would like to buy it ready-made and uh, sorry to report that uh, soups like you're seeing on the slide there, many of them are not even made with bones and on top of that there, are, there is MSG in there, it might not say MSG, but things like natural chicken flavor or autolyzed yeast extract, that is code for MSG. Uh, we can get things like um, Saffron Road or Flavor Chef, and some of us are lucky enough to live near, say, Amish farmers who sell some good homemade broth. But one way or another, we need to get it. And for many of us, that means we need to make it. And the problem for a whole lot of people is making soup is now considered in the category of creepy foods, particularly if you're making it with chicken feet. So one of the funniest things that happened over the last year was a young woman went to Safeway to buy her skinless, boneless chicken breast, and she got home and she discovered, oh my God, there's a chicken foot in there. And this young woman had a full-scale Twitter tantrum, and she said, hey, Safeway, does this look like chicken breast to you? I'm vomiting. And then she tried to extort them for ice cream for life. <laughs> As someone who makes broth all the time and deals with corpse juice, uh, I find this very funny. <laughs> 
But this is actually not funny because it's part of the problem. People are so out of, the out of touch with using all parts of the animal with nose to tail eatings. And what Mother Nature really gave us to be healthy. So I'm going to move now into the different components of broth that uh, contribute to it being such an amazing health food. Now, first of all, that's going to have a whole lot to do with the quality of what you put in the soup stock, in the pot, you know. Um, what's the quality of your vegetables? Where were they grown? Are they organic? Are they not? Are they fresh? Are they not? Um, for example, you know, fresh onions different from the ones that are sprouting, fresh carrots different from those that are moldy. Are you using the whole chicken in the pot or are you using the carcass? Are you using chicken feet and pig's hock or pick, uh, one or the other or even both? That will give you a broth that is very jiggly, extremely rich in gelatin. Are you using chicken gizzards, a wonderful, inexpensive, nutrient-dense food? Or you're using bone marrow. Marrow, one of the most nutritionally dense foods ever. So some people want to make sort of the ultimate recipe that's going to give it all every time. And my recommendation strongly is let's vary it. Let's make chicken soup, turkey soup, lamb, fish. Uh, the fish broth will have a lot of iodine, uh, a variety of broth. Let's look at the protein in broth. It's considered a poor protein, and in fact, that's true. Um, if you're thinking about just the broth, or what's sometimes called the meat tea, or the commercial version of gelatin, which would be the powdered collagen, that would be a poor protein. And it's low in tyrosine, low in histidine, and there's no tryptophan. Well, this is really not a problem because uh, you can solve that problem very easily with meat, eggs, and other high-quality proteins in your diet. And of course, if your chicken soup is not just broth, but it has some pieces of chicken, or your lamb shank soup is not just broth, but it has some lamb, it's solved right there. But if you're drinking meat tea, uh, you're probably having something else during the day, such as, for example, eggs. Nonetheless, in the 19th century, there was a headline about dogs dying from gelatin, and that scared a whole lot of people. As it turns out, as with many studies, the headlines in the newspapers did not reflect the study itself. Dug up the study and discovered, yeah, the dogs died all right, but not from gelatin, but because the gelatin was so foul and rancid and stinky that the dogs starved rather than eat it. And in fact, gelatin is a useful protein. It's not a complete protein, no doubt about that, but it has what used to be called a sparing effect. You, use that, you see that phrase a lot in 19th and 20th century uh, literature, and that means that you need less meat in order to have all the benefits from the meat protein uh, if you have soups or stews or the gelatin in the picture. And should you be on a plant-based diet, either because you're broke or because you're a vegetarian or you've just heard that the grains are healthy for us, none of us, of course, but uh, if you want to help out those grains, you make your rice with, with broth or you make your quinoa with broth instead of water, and that will improve the quality of the protein as well as its digestibility. So yeah, uh, bone broth is a poor protein, but the gelatin, um, that will pack a punch. And where that comes from is it's high in the conditionally essential amino acids, glycine, proline, and glutamine. Conditionally essential amino acids that a whole lot of dietitians tell us we all get enough of, but in fact, most of us desperately need more of. So proline. We need proline if we're going to make collagen, if we're going to have beautiful skin or cartilage. You want good knees, you're going to need proline. So um, why would somebody be deficient in proline? If you're on a high-carb diet, if you're on a vegan diet, if you're on a high-protein diet that's low-fat, if you've got a vitamin C deficiency. So glycine, simplest amino acid used to make other amino acids. And we need more glycine if there's increased need. Are you pregnant? You need more glycine. Do you have an infection? Do you do a lot of sports, bodybuilding, athletics? Are you detoxifying? 
We all need to be detoxifying. We're in a very, very toxic world, and we need glycine to make glutathione. Glutamine. We need plenty of glutamine if we're going to heal our leaky guts and if we're going to have a healthy, a healthy gut. If we've got bowel problems, um, irritable bowel, celiac disease, glutamine can help. Helps the immune system, and if you're working out a lot, muscle building. Now, have any of you heard that there's a dark side of glutamine? A whole lot of people seem to think glutamine and MSG are the same thing, and they're not. But here's the thing. Um, glutamine does cross the blood-brain the blood barrier. And at that point, glutamine is going to go either down the GABA pathway, which is calming, or down the glutamate pathway, which is excitatory. And both of them are needed, and the body in its wisdom closely regulates the process. But if somebody is sick, such as an autistic child, the glutamine can be a problem because the GABA part is not going to be working only the excitatory. So that's a simplification, but that is basically the reason why a lot of our sick ch autistic children need to start out on a GAPS diet, which features short cooked bone broth instead of long cooked. And uh, the short cooked is lower in glutamine. It's also lower in all the rest of the nutritional elements. But we have to go slow and steadily with those children, uh, and eventually, hopefully, they can get to the full full-blown nourishing broth. Another issue people like to think about is the methionine and methylation issue. Chris Masterjohn has written brilliantly about that. A whole lot of people who are focusing on muscle meat, steaks, and chops have a diet high in methionine. And even though there's proline in there, the proline's going to be low. The ratio's off. And that can contribute to methylation problems. I want to look at collagen and the manufactured form, which is gelatin. In the 19th century, there was a whole gelatin industry. That's where a whole lot of science was done, uh, a real vigorous scientific community all debating gelatin, because they wanted gelatin to solve the malnutrition problem. And it was sort of the soy protein of the 19th century. It was thought to be a miracle food that was going to solve every problem. And unfortunately, it didn't quite work out as well as they hoped. And it's been quite a while since um, any of us have been hearing about that in that way. I mean, most of us today think about Jell-O in terms of, you know, the red or green stuff they serve at hospitals. And what we need to be thinking about is the homemade gelatin, such as the gelatin that you see on the right there. So the gelatin industry became extremely popular at the point of Charles Knox and Knox Gelatin. And uh, Charles noticed that his wife Rose was spending way too much time in the kitchen making homemade gelatin and decided to uh, let her get out and have fun more and at the same time make a profit. So he developed a process by which Knox Gelatin was manufactured. It went on the market and started doing well. And then uh, Charles Knox died in 1908, and his wife Rose took over and became a pioneering businesswoman, a very powerful woman during her time, and unusual. And she got the bright idea very early on that most people weren't going to buy Knox Gelatin because her husband had a racehorse named Gelatin King or went up in a balloon called Gelatin but because uh, she came up with the idea of recipe books and helpful tips. And as the naughty nutritionist, I really like this one, the Knox Quickies. <laughs> but it, you know, she covered the territory, you know, gelatin for weight loss, be fit, not fat, gelatin for invalids, gelatin desserts. I mean, she, she knew what people wanted, and she sold that gelatin. Now, I would like to say we should get Knox gelatin today, but unfortunately, Knox today is made from, you know, factory farmed animals. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I'm going to endorse. And one of the better products on the market would be Great Lakes. That's widely available. And today we've got some small companies making really superior gelatin and collagen hydrolysate products. So this is really good news for those of us who would like to not only make homemade bone broth, but perhaps uh, supplement with some gelatin or collagen products. 
Another big topic, cartilage. If you're making homemade bone broth, there's gonna be all the globs and blobs of cartilage on those bones. You know, it's not a pick clean skeleton that you're working with. There's gonna be plenty of cartilage on there. And the amount of cartilage in your pot of broth is gonna depend on what you're starting with. A lot of knuckle bones, a lot of cartilage. If you're making shark's fin soup, I mean the shark's whole body is not bones, that's cartilage. The entire body of the, of the shark is cartilage. You're also gonna find bone in your bone broth. And again, that the quality of the bone is going to affect its nutritional profile, uh, but uh, generally about 50% minerals, 28% collagen, 22% water, you know, on average. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that if you're making bone broth, and particularly if you're cooking it for a long time, and like with chicken broth, if the bones are really soft and just about dissolved, you would think you'd have a whole lot of calcium and other minerals in there. And there's a myth out there that a lot of people keep repeating, that if you can't do dairy or you don't want to do dairy, that a cup of bone broth will give you as much calcium as a cup of milk. This is not true. It does not even come close. Uh, but there's so little calcium in bone broth. This was really shocking. And the first study I found was a 1934 one and a very good study. You know, just because a study's old doesn't mean it's not a good study. 1934 study, very low calcium. But the broth that had the most calcium was the one made with a lot of vegetables. Now this just seems so hard to believe. I mean, I would have thought, you know, the bones were making the calcium, but they were getting it from the vegetables. So this was one of those, you know, what the fuck moments. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, the first thing we did was we tried to test. So we got some superior broth from pastured hens. You know, we got it from Jessica Prentice. We had Kim Schutte, a biodynamic wellness make it. We had the best broth that's out there. And we had it tested. We had it tested a couple labs and over and over. Low calcium, just like on the USDA figures, you know, made with, say, Campbell's soup or something. So the, the big question was, OK, I have to accept that the calcium is low. So why do we have so many testimonials about people who had brittle and broken bones and osteopenia? restoring their bone mass through bone broth. Why do we have all those testimonials? And here's, here's what I came up with. The key is the collagen in the broth because the building blocks of bone are collagen fibrils. They form the scaffolding. You have to have the structure in place because without that structure, you can slap on all the calcium and other minerals you want and all you're gonna build is chalk that can start to just, um, you know, fall apart. It's like you can't build a building with concrete uh, without putting rebar in there. The structure is the most important for the strength and flexibility. And that is where bone broth shines because that's where you're gonna get a lot of that good collagen. Let's look at bone marrow. You're gonna get bone marrow if you're making homemade broth. A little bit if you're making it from chicken, a lot if you're using marrow bones. Now, of course, marrow is a very primal food. You know, it's, I mean, the ultimate carnivorous food. You know, you're licking and you're sucking. You know, it's uh, very carnal. <laughs> so marrow, um, all over the world, it's considered a sacred, energizing, and regenerative food. So you can either eat it directly or you can eat it through broth. And in the literature, most famously, Henry David Thoreau saying he wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. Interesting wording from a guy who was mostly a vegetarian. <laughs> so some of you might be wondering, OK, what's the nutritional profile of marrow look like? Well, it's really inconsistent. First of all, there's not a lot of data. And everybody's contradicting each other. So some of them say there's a lot of fat, some say a little, some say monounsaturated, some say saturated, some say it's got a lot of cholesterol, some say no cholesterol. They all talk about some phospholipids like phospholipid 
uh, serine and uh, choline, phosphatidylcholine. Uh, some say a lot of vitamin A, some say almost none, and for some reason they're not testing the vitamin D with marrow. I don't know why they're not doing that. More research is needed, obviously. So I also started wondering why the discrepancies. Well, Stephenson offers some answers. Stephenson noted in his book, the lower leg was soft and more like delicious cream in flavor. In other words, the monounsaturated fats and the humerus, the femur, was hard and tallowy at room temperature. In other words, saturated. So it's clear that it's going to depend on what kind of marrow you're analyzing and also the health of the animal, the marrow changes with starvation, for example, or whether it's cooked, if you're roasting your marrow and then testing a lot of the fat will have run off into the pan. Another component of broth that's important for health and healing are the protein sugars, proteoglycans, protein sugars, and some other names of these things, uh, mucopolysaccharides, glycosaminoglycans, which everybody calls GAGs. And uh, here's a cartilage molecule, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, hyaluronic acid. These are all forms of these protein sugars. And there's your knee, you know, just pointing out a healthy knee and how you need these things. And there's a whole industry out there on glyconutrients. Now, um, the idea is there's eight essential sugars. Now, just about everybody's getting more than enough glucose, but hunter-gatherers would have been getting a whole lot of these other things, and we do find them today in foods like, say, shiitake mushrooms or aloe vera juice and stuff like that. And we find the essential sugars, N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylgalactosamine in homemade bone broth. So let's make it. And that's much better than, uh, say, taking glucosamine or chondroitin sulfate supplements. But the fact that these are so popular and even sold in places like Walgreens, that really tells you that they're helping some people because people aren't buying these things out of pocket unless they're seeing some benefit. So my recommendation is, you know, glucosamine is useful. You know, the science is really mixed. There's thousands of studies, and they can't figure out why it works sometimes and doesn't work other times. But my recommendation is the broth because there's so many healing components. Why, why settle for just glucosamine? So broth and disease, big topic. A whole lot of people seem to think, well, yeah, it's nourishing, it's good food, um, but it would be an old wives' tale that it can actually heal anything. Well, some of the 19th century literature, they talk a lot about how broth helps with nasty infectious diseases such as dysentery, cholera, typhoid, scarlet fever. And of course, these, um, you know, broth was not reviving all of these people, but it helped many. And that's why Florence Nightingale and many others were recommending it, and it was in all those cookbooks. Now, getting into some more recent studies, um, some scientists at Mount Sinai Hospital, they decided that it was just bogus, the idea that soup would help open up your sinus pathways, that it had to be soup. They thought hot water would work as well. And they discovered, to their surprise, that the hot soup did, in fact, work better, and cold water did not work at all. But the most famous soup study came out of University of Nebraska from a pulmonary care expert by the name of Stephen Renard, MD. And he took his wife's grandmother's Lithuanian chicken soup recipe, and he decided he was going to test it. And to simplify his study, he basically had a bowl of soup, and he dropped in some neutrophils. And then the headlines came out, why chicken soup heals colds and flu. Kills neutrophils. And I'm looking at that, and I'm scratching my head, and I'm saying, why would you want to kill your neutrophils? I mean, I don't want to suffer from cold or flu any more than anybody else, but I understand that my neutrophils really matter, and I should honor them, not kill them. And then there were some other weird things about Renard's study, including the fact that he tested all of these totally awful products like Progresso and Nor and other uh, soups high in MSG. And here's what's strange. Some of them, the neutrophils died even faster, which you might expect. 
And some of them, the neutrophils swimmed around really happily. <laughs> So it made no sense whatsoever. So from my point of view, uh, there was a lot more to learn and study and just needed to look at all the research. So I've got a couple heroes in this project. One of them was Nathan R. Gotthofer, PhD. Lived from 1901 to 1983. And 18 years of his life, this man spent researching gelatin. He was with Gray's Lake Gelatin at the time. That's the company that's now Great Lakes Gelatin. And um, he pulled up all the late 18th century, 19th century, early 20th century, and he was able to meet a lot of the researchers. He traveled. I mean, he was just a very curious guy and very dogged and persistent to find out. And um, he was really thrashing out why the studies were so consistent. And what seems to be the case is that there were a whole lot of gelatins, uh, excuse me, a whole lot of definitions of what gelatin was. Sometimes it was made from hides, sometimes it would be like we would make it, you know, where there'd be a lot of cartilage in it too. Uh, some studies that they called gelatin studies were actually uh, done with, say, glycine. So of course it was all consistent, inconsistent. So couldn't find out too much about Dr. Gotthofer himself, but in the Cornell University alumni notes, I scored uh, some facts and a picture. He is that elderly gentleman in the top right. Another one of the pioneer gelatin researchers was Dr. Francis Pottinger of Pottinger's Cats fame. And he did some important studies that are easy to find on what he called hydrophilic colloids and don't have time to go into that in depth right here, but I'm gonna give you his takeaway. Gelatin has proven effective for a variety of gastrointestinal ailments. Right on, and that's important because, as Hippocrates put it, all disease begins in the gut, which is why if we're doctors or alternative medicine practitioners and we're thinking about nutrition, we start with gut healing no matter what other symptoms people have. Much science having to do with broth and digestion, uh, the bland diets that were popular, say, 50 years ago, the importance of gelatin in infant formula, such as the Weston A. Price Foundation's homemade formula. Gelatin, if you've got peptic ulcers, acid reflux, uh, celiac disease, irritable bowel, etc. And, you know, we all know here that the brain and the gut are very much together and just quickly point out some mental health issues. Uh, broth is good for your mental health and stability. If that woman who had her Twitter tantrum had eaten broth with or made broth from that chicken foot, she'd have probably been a lot more stable. <laughs> Maimonides recommended chicken soup for melancholy. Chinese medicine considers it a yin tonic for burnout. Glycine helps with blood sugar swings, and so on and so forth. Move into another of my heroes, a man I was privileged to do some work with, Dr. John F. Pruden. In 1997, I interviewed him eight times. A brilliant man, very funny, absolutely brilliant. Doctor's doctor, best of the best, and he died in 1998, sadly. And I'm very happy at this point to be able to share a lot of his research in the book I've got coming out, the one with Sally Fallon called Nourishing Broth, coming out end of September. Well, Dr. Pruden was the son of, son of an osteopath. He became an MD, uh, Harvard, Columbia, and a lot of his early work came out of the work he did at Fort Sam where he was trying to heal the wounds of soldiers who'd come back all blown to bits from Korea. And uh, cortisol was very big, cortisone treatments rather, were very big at the time with disastrous side effects. And he was trying to find a solution. Uh, Dr. Pruden, um, let's see, okay. So it was first with wound healing. And then at some point he discovered by some miraculous coincidences that cartilage chips on the wound made it heal faster. They'd been trying all sorts of things and then some guy suggested cartilage chips and everybody thought they were crazy. Uh, and the wounds healed so quickly and they healed well. 
And from there, Dr. Pruden went on to do more and more research with cartilage. And among other things, he found out that it uh, could turn around herpes, shingles, mononucleosis, and other viral problems, which has something to do, I think, with why broth can heal colds and flu and other problems. He also found that it could reverse osteoarthritis, even severe oste osteoarthritis where the joints were, were totally cracked and degenerated. He found it could reverse rheumatoid arthritis, and the patients he were working with were totally debilitated. I'm not talking about early stage or prevention here, which of course that it does even better, but late stages, people who were, who were in agony. He turned around scleroderma. He softened the skin of these people with the hidebound disease where they were, their skin got so tight around them that they were prisoners in their own skin. He turned around uh, psoriasis and um, irritable bowel, colitis, and Crohn's. You know, these patients were, shall we say, flushed with success. Now, some of you may realize at this point that a lot of these are autoimmune disorders. Now, that's kind of controversial, but um, a lot of good, solid health practitioners believe that's what we got here. And I just want to point out here that um, with multiple sclerosis, Dr. Terry Walls has uh, included broth in her healing protocols for that and other autoimmune disease. Dr. Pruden also turned around cancer cases, terminal cases, the kind of cancers that nobody could cure then or now. 31 cases, and these are all written up in the very best medical journals. And of course, nobody has ever heard of them. But they're there. So, um, why did he think he was having these results? Well, he wasn't entirely sure, but working with a whole lot of other top scientists all over the world, they discovered some things. Cartilage was a potent normalizer, a true biological response modifier, an activator of macrophages, activator of natural killer cells, rouses B lymphocytes, and releases a colony stimulating factor. That's for starters. So what does that exactly have to do with autoimmune disease. Now this is where I come in with my crazy controversial theory. Uh, the whole idea of pleomorphic bacteria, mycoplasma, mutating bacteria, the kind of bacteria that shift into viruses that are stealth operators and that can camouflage themselves so people don't notice them. And they're known to hide in connective tissue. So what seems to be happening is the body knows they're there and the body destroys its own collagen and cartilage tissue trying to get rid of them. So where a whole lot of people think autoimmune disease is the body's immune system going wacko for no particular reason that anyone can figure out, maybe it is that the body in its wisdom is trying to eradicate some of these stealth bacteria but the body doesn't have the ability to do so effectively. So this theory is coming out of some of the top scientists um, that have ever been born, people like Royal Rife, Peyton Roos, many others. And in the field of rheumatoid arthritis, Thomas McPherson Brown started out as an esteemed rheumatologist, best of the best, Rockefeller Institute, many places. But then uh, after World War II, nobody wanted to hear about his mutating bacteria theory, and uh, he basically died controversial. Uh, Virginia Livingston, uh, MD, she um, connected leprosy and cancer with these pleomorphic bacteria. Again, a very controversial researcher and physician. And then we have Dr. Alan Cantwell, who's still alive, respected dermatologist, published more than 30 articles in major medical journals, and he found pleomorphic bacteria in scleroderma and um, some other related diseases that he was treating as a dermatologist. 
So sadly, uh, he finally concluded, we believe the body is not attacking itself, but is desperately trying to rid itself of disease-producing microbes that are not recognized by the scientific community. And he is a very angry, frustrated man, and has become an extremely, um, well, he's known as a medical heretic. And a lot of his research was absolutely impeccable, and as I said, top medical journals. So he's been busy lately writing about, you know, AIDS conspiracies and, you know, cancer microbes and other controversial topics. So some of you might be thinking, so what do mutating bacteria, medical heretics, and conspiracy theories have to do with broth? Okay, briefly, Gotthofer reported cases from the late 19th and early 20th century in which gelatin helped heal TB a disease that everyone recognizes caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Avicenna in the 10th century discovered that the best cure for leprosy was the broth from a young fat hen. Dr. Livingston found mycobacterium tuberculosis in TB and leprosy. Dr. Cantwell found mycobacterium tuberculosis in scleroderma and then later as a primary agent in HIV. There is yet one other theory which I'm only very briefly going to go into because it is flat out wrong. Uh, some people have talked about cartilage as a supplement, such as shark cartilage, being used and being effective because of anti-angiogenesis. And that theory has to do with the fact that in healthy cartilage there are no blood vessels. And cartilage contains uh, anti-angiogenesis factors. And if cancer is going to grow and develop in the body, uh, you're going to have to have new blood vessels going in there. So the idea is if you take cartilage pills with the anti-angiogenesis factors, that can be a cure. The problem with that theory, which was publicized very heavily by the Sharks Don't Get Cancer uh, guy, is that Judah Folkman, who went ballistic over this thing, he said they don't survive the digestive process, so you're not gonna get them from broth and you're not gonna get them from pills, but you might benefit from, say, injections. So very quickly, you know, this is a sports and fitness crowd here. Broth is fabulous for sports and fitness. Uh, early ads for gelatin and Bovril, which was a gelatin uh, beef uh, product. Uh, it's going to put the beef in you. You know, don't be a 90-pound weakling. Let's let's build up here. Many of the early uh, bodybuilding champs, the great Sando, Armin Tanny, the great Vince Gironda, and their diets, their recommended bodybuilding protocols included meat, eggs, gallons of milk, and some gelatin. Uh, most of them did not have a whole lot of gelatin. Uh, many of them probably got enough glutamine because they were drinking gallons of milk. But if you don't want to drink gallons of milk, and you probably don't unless you really want to get fat, um, I would strongly recommend uh, homemade broth or some of the collagen hydrolysate or gelatin products. And thanks to Randy Roach for coming up with all the dietary protocols of some of these um, uh, athletes. So the final section, going through quickly, anti-aging. We all want to be immortal, right? Shark cartilage soup, reputation as an aphrodisiac and as an elixir. And the above real ads, uh, they really picked up on that. The old guys, above real, will put a man on his feet, you know, out of the wheelchair onto the track. And a very interesting little aside, uh, broth can turn around cellulite. In the late 1990s, Dr. Pruden told me that uh, some of his patients were mazed. They got smooth skin, and their cellulite disappeared, and they lost their arthritis. Okay, cod sperm soup, aphrodisiac, rooster testicle soup, velvet antler cartilage products for your love life. So in conclusion, broth is not going to resurrect the dead, but it might be just the thing to keep us juicy for life. Uh, I'm 
going to, as soon as they kick me out of here, I'm going to head to the farm to consumer booth. So anybody who wants to talk more about broth, that's where we'll be. Thank you.